We're going to transition over to the lab now. I'm going to cut you off. No more questions. Um, and well, Dr. Naidu is going to be discussing uh, the Vertiflex interspinous decompression spacer. Thanks, Doug. And uh, thank you so much for giving us a great lecture on the radiological confirmation of lumbar spinal stenosis. So real quickly, the purpose of the Vertiflex spacer is to be an extension blocker, okay? So as you can see, it's basically a titanium H in the interspinous space. And what's beautiful about the procedure is you can do it through a half-inch incision. So basically it goes enclosed, if we can zoom in on this guy. And then what I do is I simply just open it and that's what's deploying in the interspinous space. So I'm gonna show you that in the cadaver here. And the way that works is if we look at the fluoro shot, hopefully you guys can all see the fluoro right now. So we have a typical uh, spinal stenosis patient, as you can see here, with a degree of scoliosis, uh, as you see in the lumbar spine. And so um, just to presuming, if you look at the interspinous space at L34, I'll just show you what the L3 spinous process is. That's this guy right here, okay? Um, and as you can see here, we have that, that angulation uh, towards the right side at L3 in comparison to L4 down here, okay? So the goal of this procedure is to simply get this titanium spacer in between those two spinous processes. So what we've done here is we've gotten those spinous processes as midline as possible, and obviously with scoliosis, that's more challenging, but what we're using are, if you look at the pedicles of L3 and the pedicles of L4, we're really trying to make sure that they're equidistant from the spinous processes, right? So think of them as the owl's face, if you will, the two eyes or the pedicles, the spinous process is the nose. If you're kind of seeing a normal looking owl, you're in good shape. Then the next thing we do is we line up the superior end plate of the inferior body we're working at. So in this case, the superior end plate of L4 is what we want to line up. You can see that intradiscal space here, more radial lucens. So in general, uh, that's how we want to line up for fluoro. Really important you make sure you line up everything well in the beginning of your case. Um, if the patient has a, a significant rotatory scoliosis, what I do is I rotate the bed so that basically zero degrees on the C-arm is perfectly AP on that patient so that when I go back between lateral and AP, lateral and AP, I'm really getting true orthogonal views rather than you know, just starting with an oblique view that's AP and then you go lateral, but the, but the C-arm can't over-rotate and now you're, you know, ch you're challenged, I'll just say that. So the way I do this is I, I first start by making a dot at the inferior aspect of the superior spinous process uh, and then a dot somewhere down below at the inferior dot of the L4 spinous process. I draw a straight line um, between those two dots Okay, perfect. And the, the length of that line only needs to be 1.2 centimeters minimally, um, but generally people go up to about 1.5 centimeters, okay? And so we'll obviously use local anesthesia and then in size, okay? And then what I like to do is just feel for that interspinous groove, okay? So I can really get a, a sense of where I'm going. And then I take the first instrument, which is dilator one, uh, oftentimes comes with a cap, I take the cap off personally because I like to mallet directly on the metal. It gives me more uh, fidelity on what I'm malleting rather than hitting a plastic top. So the key thing here, this is probably the most important part of the procedure, is really making sure dilator one is right in between. So I actually like where this is going, but I can obviously optimize. So that would be a very nice view there. So then with my left hand, I hold dilator one and I mallet. And then I just go back and forth between my sponge clamp and my left hand. So then I'll take a fluoro shot, make sure that, perfect. So this is probably the most important thing is just this back and forth. Don't go too far. If you go down the wrong path, so you see here I'm going off a little bit to the right. So I'll make an adjustment. Now I'm gonna come back to the left. If you go down the wrong path, you really make the procedure harder. So for the anesthesiologists in the audience, you know the first time you intubate is the best time. You know it gets harder and harder every time you have to go in a second or third time. So you want to really make sure you get this in right the first time. So I'm just going millimeter by millimeter. I'm getting a feel with my left hand. And as you can see here, I'm starting to get into the interspinous space. 
And my end point here is looking for something called purchase. That just means simply the dilator stands up on its own, okay? And I'm not quite there yet. I have to still hold up. And I'm just getting there. You see that? Standing up on its own, perfect. So now, even though it's coming in at a bit of an angle, I can make that adjustment. I'm okay. The tip of dilator one is right in the inner spine of space, so I'm happy with that. So Steve, let's go to a lateral. On the side of dilator one are depth marking, so I can see I'm at 30 millimeters. Um, that's, you know, for a relatively normal BMI patient, that is usually the average before we get purchase. If you're ever concerned you're going too deep, you can always take a lateral, take a shot there, Steve, if you don't mind. Perfect. And so you can see here, I'm in that inner spine of space. Now, uh, maybe Doug can point this out on the screen there. There's something called the spinal laminar line. That is the shadow of the lamina. That is the line to not ever cross, okay? That's the river sticks. So what we're going to do with every instrument here on out is really take that uh, to that spinal laminar line. So I'll just mallet down a little bit further here. And shot there, Steve, if you don't mind. So we'll just go little by little. The only thing you can do to screw up this procedure is go too far into the spinal canal. Do not do that, okay? Then Dr. Nora will be very upset with you, and that collaboration talk will be very different next year. So then after dilator one is in place, I take the cannula assembly. It's actually two instruments in one. And a shot there, Steve, if you don't mind. So if, you, if Doug can point this out, there is an outer cannula, which is that big, thick cylinder in the back. And then inside, there's that tapered uh, cannula. That's dilator two, historically known as. And so what I'm trying to do is get dilator two, the tip of that, to the spinal laminar line. Shot there, Steve. Perfect. Naturally, dilator one comes back a little bit. You can always put your finger down. Shot there, Steve, if you want and advance it, but you don't have to. And shot there. Perfect. So dilator two, you can see, is still a little bit just short, but I got basically where I wanted to be. Another thing you can do is look at the outer cannula and, and get it to about 30% across the inner spine of space. So I'm happy with that. I'll take this out. Steve, why don't we go ahead and do the down the barrel shot? So this will check my work. How well are we in the inner spine of space? Um, so you probably just need to do a little oblique on the II towards you and then just get that AP shot. So we're gonna be able to see what the channels above and below, whether I'm <clears throat> great. So I'm a little bit right-sided, that's okay. Let's check the bottom now, a caudal tilt on the II. And so we're gonna look at the channels below. And this is pretty common with scoliosis, just really understanding what adjustments I can make going forward, but this will work. A little bit more caudal on the II, Steve. Really like a Ferguson view, yep. Keep coming, keep coming, yep, shot there. A little bit more, please. More caudal than the instrument. Yep. Keep going. So you, you just need to be more caudal on the II than the instrument. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. There you go. Perfect. So you can see that channel. Again, a little bit right side. And let's go back to a lateral. But I can make that adjustment here. So you can see those two prongs. Maybe Doug can point that out. They're actually straddling that inferior spinous back to a lateral, Steve. So that actually looks good. So I don't need to redo anything, but I, I can make some slight adjustments here. So the next step through that working channel is now the Game of Thrones weapon called the Reamer. Some people call it the pineapple. I like that. That's cool too. Um, so we just drop that in, take a shot there. Great. So now you're going to see the pineapple or Game of Thrones weapon and get to the spinal laminar line. Shot there. This is clearing out the soft tissue. So I'll take that a little bit further to that spinal laminar line. Shot there. Perfect. Love it. Take that out. Then we measure. So this is called the interspinous gauge. And I just take it past the black line shot there. I haven't opened it. I'm just showing you where it's going to open. You notice that little notch in the superior spinous process? That's where I would like my superior to lie, so shot there. So even though it's not touching the bone, that's okay. You can see this bar is bending up. That's where the tension point is. Again, you do not want to kyphose this patient. We're not trying to create flexion. We just want it to sit and be an extension blocker. So if you look, if the camera can somehow look at the numbers, beautiful, I can see it. It's between 12 and 14. So I'm going to size down. I'm going to do a 12 millimeter here. And 12 millimeters is really the most common size we see. Interestingly, from the IDE study, um, 14 millimeters was the most commonly used size, but that study was done all by surgeons. <laughs> Maybe they were a little overzealous on the sizing. Um, but 12 or 10 is really what we see now. So uh, 
Uh, Teresa just gave me a 12 millimeter Superion. That was the purple one. They come in candy colors, you know, just for the kids. Um, so when you drop it in, you can see the, the, the beak of the Superion. I want to make sure the tips are not past that spinal laminar line. If I deploy this anterior of that spinal laminar line, I'm going to get caught on the lamina, right? And the last thing we want is for this to propel itself into the spinal canal. So I'm right at the edge, but I'm pretty happy. So I'm going to start to deploy this. And I'm just using three fingers. I'm not using a lot of force. I'm going to keep on going until I actually feel resistance. Take a shot there. Great. So it's opening. You might see that the cam lobes, the two arms are a little offset. Well, this patient has scoliosis. I'm coming in at a slight angle, so that's normal. So three fingers there. I'm starting to meet resistance, but they're opening symmetrically. So I'm not worried about it catching on the lamina at this point. So shot there. Perfect. Now I'm going to do something called the sagittal arc just to create some space in the soft tissue. So it's a firm press towards the head, firm press towards the feet, and then back to the middle, and then three fingers there, meeting some resistance, okay? So it might be getting caught at the very top. If you notice, the bottom opened a little bit, but the top didn't. So now what we're going to do is look at an AP, and we're going to see if my adjustments that I made going a little bit more to the left uh, were good enough or maybe, again, too much. So now what we're going to do, Steve, in fact, this is fine. So we're going to see the superior cam lobes here. So you can see my left arm might be touching the superior spinous process. And now we're going to do that caudal tilt on the II or cranial on the source. So big Ferguson tilt. Big, 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 more than the instrumentation. So you're going to be more like at this angle, so almost like 40 degrees. Yep. Now we're going to see the inferior cam lobes. Okay. And so this is not only is my left arm touching the superior, my right leg or the right lower cam lobe is touching the inferior. So I'm going to do a little bit of a counterclockwise rotation. Perfect. So now what I'll do is I'll just do that counterclockwise. I know I'm behind the lamina while I'm doing the sagittal arc. I'm just going to bring that back into place. Shot there. See? Left arm, you can already tell, is coming off. Now I'm going to see if I can open. And look, it's much easier with my three fingers, my three measly fingers. We like to see people really get um, aggressive and firm and whatever else and show off their strength. Totally unnecessary for this procedure. Just use your three fingers. Although these titanium H's are really strong, they, they can break if you really, really try to. There's a lot of torque and pressure put onto this small device. So really be not gentle with it, but be mindful of how much force to use. And as you can see here, now that I'm opening, I've got my cam lobes pretty nicely situated. Um, and it comes to a full stop. So now I'm fully deployed. So now we can come back to a lateral. I take out the driver. This is what was opening the device. And now I'm just going to mallet this down to that spinal laminar line. And I don't need to make any adjustments because I really liked how I opened here. We'll take a shot when Steve is ready. And we should be sitting fairly close to the lamina. You don't need to be on it. Again, if there's some soft tissue in between, you know, the purpose isn't really to, to bang it right on. You see they're a little offset. Again, with that scoliosis, that is to be expected. I actually like the, where we're at. And then I'll flip the lever in the front. I'll do a side-to-side -side shake to get the tangs out of the superior shot there, Steve. Perfect, and then come to an AP. And now you have what we sought out to do, which is put the superion in that interspinous space. Um, and Steve will give us a final shot to confirm. Always save your final images. Make sure you do that because if somehow something happens, you know, that someone says, oh, it dislodged or migrated, you can always come back and say, no, no, this is my final shot. This is how I did it to the textbook, and then you're saving yourself some issues in court. Doug, I'll pass it back to you. Any questions? Great work, Ramo. As we'll open it up, questions or comments? Dr. Fleming. One of the common um, uninformed criticisms from some surgical colleagues is that uh, these will induce uh, kyphosis. So your response to that and why or why not so it does induce focal kyphosis. The question really is the effect on the sagittal balance, and I think that's the major objection, right, Neil? The objection is uh, if we have any adverse effect on the sagittal balance, that's uh, 
uh, adverse effect on the patient's ability to walk and stand and so forth. So uh, lumbar lordosis is anywhere 50 to 60 degrees normally. Uh, Peter Wong's done some great work on this that uh, if you put one or two of these in, it does not change the sagittal balance and overall uh, from top of um, L1 to the bottom of L5 or top of S1 really. So you can put up the two spacers. That's why all interspinous decompression spacers or fusion spacers are all indicated one or two levels. So uh, focal kyphosis, yes, but that's the secret sauce. That's what un unpinches the cauda equina. That's what allows it uh, to mimic the seated position. But overall, the lumbar lordotic angle, unchanged. Yeah, we know from the IDE study that the sagittal balance remained, and that was proven by the radiological studies that were taken out to five years with those patients. Key point, it wasn't emphasized enough. Now there's a publication on that, as Doug just mentioned. Second point is, it, it's not the device, it's the operator. And we've seen some individuals put in oversized implants, and so we need to be mindful of that. Um, you know, there's a big debate to undersize or oversize. I, I tend to undersize. Maybe Doug could argue, well, you're not getting the best bang out of your buck for undersizing in some situations, and that may be true, but I certainly don't want to kyphose the patient. So I think it depends on, again, what you're sizing and then, you know. It has to do with degree of instability. It has to do, to do with the, the size of the overall patient, right? So my Five feet scrub tech is very different than one of the fellows that I've had previously that was six, seven. Uh, these people are different size, right? And it also has to do with which level you're doing. And so all of these is we get systems that are able to uh, distract as much as you want to, very powerful distraction. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And as Ramo mentioned, 12 will be the most common. The second most common size will be 14. The third most common size will be 10 in that order, top three. Yes. In case I need to do two devices, two adjacent levels, after I do the first one, the blow level will be too tight, too close. Technically, how I can overcome this problem? Yeah, it will be a little bit tighter, but it has kind of a negligible result. So uh, I've never encountered um, a, an adjacent segment level that I've not been able to do just based on the presence of one spacer. And typically, you know, I do the worst level first. It, it, there's no requirement for that, but you'll find that once you, uh, this goes through this, what's called the sagittal band or the supraspinous ligament. And once you section that supraspinous ligament, you'll be able to distract it pretty easily. That's right. No issues there. Choose the worst level first. Yeah. In terms of patients who then go on to need surgery, will these have any impact on kind of uh, our surgical colleagues' planning and their ability to perform the surgery and their outcomes of surgery? So I'm going to let uh, Dr. Shonar take that one. Uh, none, none, none at all. Uh, so if the procedure fails, uh, open treatment takes the same path as the surgical approach to put in the device. Uh, so uh, the morbidity of the approach is identical. Uh, so there's there's no problem taking it out uh, from a, 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 a dual level approach. Do you ever have conflict of the extended arms of the base level when you're doing the next level up? Uh, do you have compromise in deployment or conflict in uh, deployment of the okay. legs? Not often, but sometimes. The, th the thing that I really like about these, the arms, the cam lobes, they're very thin. They're very thin, so you can have contact, but they'll in, but they'll almost inevitably. And I've never seen a single exception. You'll be able to get it in, and we'll lie directly next to each other. The other thing about these spacers is bone loves titanium. So whenever it comes time to take them out, realize that they may be grown in, like a segment of barbed wire through a tree, and these will commonly be fused. And if you look at going back to a, a previous article. Uh, we looked at uh, X stops and what happened after that, and a few, few, uh, full 25% of those will have fusion demonstrable on CT. So these interspinous spacers, although they're motion preserving, the vertiflex superion is, uh, it's, you still, when it comes time to take it out, uh, have your legs already because this is sometimes grown in. The cam lobes are shaped to be uh, put together on adjacent levels. If you look at this in a I'll turn the camera since the camera is coming from above. You can see there's a curvature 
There's a very purposeful orientation to these devices. So they are made to be adjacent. If by chance the spinous process is, is short in height and they overlap, well, that's okay. There, it's a, if there's an overlap, that's all right because they might be offset just by a little bit if you look at it in 90 degrees. Um, but they are me meant to form next to each other because of the curvature of the cam lobes. That's a great point, Ramo. Yes. Is there a degree of uh, scoliosis that you would kind of like you have front on like not considering vertiflex? So typically, the uh, if you look at inclusion exclusion criteria, it's about 15 degrees at the incident level. So for most of these, the IDE trial was 15 degrees. So yeah, more than 15 degrees at the incident level is probably too much. Okay, guys, we'll take a short break. We'll resume here uh, in a, let's take 10, and we'll resume with uh, interspinous fusion spacer demo. You guys.